Welcome to the Resilient Recruiter Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Whitby, and today we're joined by Matt Balama. For the last three years, Matt has billed over a million dollars a year, and as the founder of Pioneer Search Group, Matt specializes in the material handling automation space. His own background is actually material handling equipment sales, so it's an industry he knows inside out and is passionate about. Matt's been in the executive search business for over 20 years. He's placed professionals at all levels from general manager, president, COO, and VP level to regional sales, manager, sales reps, and engineers all over North America. Matt, welcome. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much, Mark. It's great to be here with you today. Awesome. My pleasure. I'm I'm looking forward to this. So me too. Um how by the way, how how did you hear, because we connected on LinkedIn and exchanged messages, and that's what led us to to this. How did you find me? You know, I uh, I think I found you on LinkedIn just surfing one night, and then um, I decided to click on one of your podcasts. I can't remember which one. I think it might have been with Jordan, Jordan Rayboy, who I kind of know through my franchise network that I'm a part of, and... I was kind of fascinated by it. Really surprised that there was a platform for, you know, people like us that are in the in the search business on a podcast. And obviously podcasts have exploded over the last three or four years. And so then I just went over to Spotify and every so often I would, you know, listen to what you had going on for whatever interview you had going on that particular time. All right. So. Awesome. Well, that's cool. And and here you are on the show. So that's uh uh it it, it the podcast has been amazing Crazy. for connect, yeah, connecting me with brilliant people, and it's such a privilege to have this platform to be able to have interesting, fun conversations uh, like this. So, yeah, um, I'm glad that you, I'm glad you did find me. Yeah, H- how did you get into the search business, Matt? Well, I was, you know, like you shared in the intro. Um, I sold material handling equipment. It's my first job out of college Mm -hmm. and um, did that for about five years. And uh, there was a, there, there was a, uh, an opening basically in a nutshell at a local search firm. It was an MRI office, a sales consultants office. Mm -hmm. And they basically reached out to me. I knew a couple of people there and uh, they said, Hey, we want you to come in and, and interview. I think it was for another industrial sales job. Well, this was in 1999, and lo and behold, they had a need for uh, basically a, another recruiter for their team. And I was recently married and really had no idea about what I was getting myself into. Um, it seemed very interesting to me. I was sick of traveling around in my in my used Honda Accord making cold calls all day trying to sell forklifts. And... <laughs> and uh, I said, you know what, uh, this is pretty cool. I can sit in an office all day, make, you know, talk to people, make phone calls. Um, people that knew me and that were around me, including my former boss at the time said, you're crazy. You'll hate it. Don't do it. It's a, it's a brutal business. And I would say that he was probably half right. Uh, and I decided to go for it. And here we sit right now. Amazing. That's a great story. Thanks for yeah. sharing that. Yeah, it's funny how often that happens where people go to interview for one job and then the recruiter ends up persuading them to come and work at that agency rather than the job they originally were interested in. Right. Um, and so uh, when did you start Pioneer Search? I started Pioneer Search Group in 2008 and uh, I had worked at the other MRI sales consultants firm uh, from 99 until 2006. And quite frankly, I, at, at, when 2006 rolled around, I was, I would say honestly that I was burned out um, just from the grind. And uh, I had the opportunity to do something totally different. So I ended up, ended up wholesaling life insurance and fixed annuities um, in and around West Michigan and, and the state of Michigan to, um, you know, financial advisors, estate planning attorneys, et cetera. And to be honest, that was a, a new and exciting industry that I had, I knew nothing about, but I could kind of leverage my sales and my cold calling skills. Um, and it was almost like a sabbatical for me. Like I needed a break and, um, I got away from it and it was, it was, it was good. 
Um, but then kind of in the middle of that, that journey, um, you know, I always knew in the back of my mind that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Uh, I wanted to kind of see if I could, you know, scratch that itch, if you will, and, and, uh, have my own business. Um, I mean, obviously when you start a search firm, it doesn't really take a whole lot of capital, uh, just, uh, you know, a lot of guts and, um, Fast forward, I don't know, it was probably a year and a half or so into my journey in, you know, doing insurance. And I wrote a letter to myself on our personal computer, just kind of figuring out almost like a, uh, you know how in, when we, I don't know if, if you have ever used this training uh, idea when we're, talk, when we're talking about closing candidates, but it was kind of like a ben, a ben Franklin close where you have pros on the left, cons on the right. And it was about, do I stay in the insurance business and continue to do what I'm doing? I could go work for an insurance carrier. I could go work for another firm. I could really get into life insurance sales. Or should I try this executive search business? So in a nutshell, I wrote this thing out on on, the, on our family computer. And um, I left it open. Not really, in, you know, I, I, I didn't do it on purpose. And my wife saw it and she's like, I had no idea that you had these aspirations at this level, um, I know you can do this and I think you should do it. And so, um, we started the process of, you know, what, you know, what, what does that really look like? And so I started to do some research on, well, we need, we need health insurance. We need, you know, in case I need money, I'm going to have to, you know, tap a home equity line of credit. We did that. Um, and, uh, you know, next thing you know, I had all these things lined up. I went out and got an LLC. I think I paid, I don't know, three or 400 bucks for that. And uh, that was at the early part of 2008. Um, uh, I went into um, my boss, who's actually a friend of mine now, and said, look, I'm starting my own search firm. He's like, good for you. I had an outstanding commission that I was waiting to get paid on that. Thank goodness. He paid me on that later on down the road. Cause I would have needed that. And, um, I had two young girls. Uh, I had a, uh, um, you know, basically a, uh, five-year-old and a, and a three-year-old at the time, roughly. I can't remember the exact ages. And we took the plunge. My wife worked part-time. Um, and, so I resigned and uh, my parents uh, had bought us a weekend at a water park. And so we went up there for the weekend and uh, uh, came back Saturday. And on a, on a Sunday, I walked down to this office that my dad's real good friend's cousin gave to me, basically rent free. And I, I set up an office with a desk that was given to me. It was, uh, and you know, they already had a phone system set up and a bunch of legal pads and, you know, it was 08. So it was kind of before LinkedIn, kind of before all these, all this great tech that we have now. And I was like, you have got to be kidding me. This is about to begin. And, uh, it was a grind, like uh, looking back, like nothing you could ever imagine. And it's still a grind. And I think if, if you don't, if you're not willing to grind, I don't care if you're doing a million dollars a year, if you're trying to build up to a million dollars a year, or you're doing 250 or four, whatever, it doesn't matter what the number is. You have to be willing to grind and embrace the grind. This is okay. Let's talk about this, Matt. Thanks for, first of all, thanks for the telling me that that story that was that was cool and i it's awesome how your wife supported you and and read that letter that you'd written to yourself kind of almost like you were it was you were journaling essentially right you were yeah. you were trying to get those ideas out of your head where they can be all jumbled up and get them kind of get some clarity right it sounds like what you were looking for and that's a neat way of doing it and she happened to see that and then you know told you to go for it i i love that <clears throat> and but the grind got you in trouble the first time because you said you got burnt out. And I think we should really explore this topic of embracing the grind. 
What was different in the first recruiting job where you got burnt out and felt like you needed to even move away and do something completely different versus where now you say embrace the grind and and you see it as like just it's it's necessary and you're and you're up for the for the task. What what's the difference there between when you burnt out versus now? Um, I I I think for me, Mark, it was um, you know there were there were some new dynamics inside that firm. Um, you know, uh, you know, I, I took a personality test once, and you know, one of the one of the things that it revealed to me is that I really need to probably just be on my own. And, you know, I, I set up my kind of my, my own world way of the way that I look at things is kind of, even if I, even when I was working for someone else is kind of my own business. And, uh, uh, so I think what I realized through that journey is that, um, I probably didn't give myself enough credit for saying, Hey, you know what, you need to go out and try a business. Um, you're going to be successful. Uh, you're a hard worker. Uh, maybe it was a confidence issue. I don't know. Um, but I will say when you're, when you're now, when you, when you pull the trigger on your own business, you have a wife, you have young kids. Um, there's no choice. You have to make it work. And, you know, there were, there, there, there were times like in 09, you know, 2009, 2010, Every once in a while, I would go online and try and look at open like talent acquisition jobs at companies like, wouldn't it be nice to go work at Coca-Cola or Kellogg's as a talent acquisition director? You get a nice base salary and you can work, you know, nine to five and you get four weeks of vacation. I, I would do those things once in a while. Like I would catch myself looking for jobs like that. Um, but I never, <laughs> I never applied it. I never applied to any of them. <laughs> so li listen, this is really, uh, I'm really glad you're, you're opening up and being vulnerable in this because I think um, we, we all have confidence issues from time to time. And also this job, you know, whether it's your business or, or whatever, it, it can be a grind. And um, so it's, I think, it's it's really important to if you know people hear you say that and yet you've stuck at it and you've made it into a really successful uh, practice. I still you haven't. I don't feel like you fully answered the question, Matt, about the burnout the first time. Like what what did you learn from that experience that you've applied in running your own business that allows you to to work so hard but have it be sustainable. Well, I, th I mean, I think that's a, that's a very, uh, a, a I mean, it's a very good question. Um, you know, I, I think for me, um, the, the main, the main burnout issue was yeah, you, you have to remember in, in 99, I come into the business in 01, we have nine 11 in the, in the world that I was in, I was in, in the kind of this industrial generalized market where I was doing capital equipment and steel and material handling, um, at that time, those industries were kind of in a in a lull, and I would even say in a little bit of a recession. Um, then the the firm wanted me to move in some other uh, industries, so I never felt that I could really make make the 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 traction that I wanted. Um, and I just felt to myself, you know, I've been here six years, I'm not producing at the levels that I, that I want to to produce at. Again, no one's fault. Um, the, the there were some there, there 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 were some cultural things that changed, and I just needed to get out. I needed to get out, and you know at the time I I probably didn't realize um, the the path I was on, but it was it was a path that I had to take. Because had had I stayed there, I never, I, I probably would have left the business and totally gotten out of the recruiting business, done something totally different. Let. Let me run something past you. I, I don't want to psychoanalyze you. That's not my job. But it occurs to me but from what you're saying that the difference is before, well, there's two main differences. One is that you weren't 100% happy in the environment that you're in, and now you are running your own show. So that is obviously a big difference. But the other thing you said, and I, or I heard you say, correct me if I'm wrong, you were working super hard, but you weren't getting the results that you wanted. Correct. Whereas now you're working hard, but you're getting good results. So 
subjectively speaking, that feels a lot different, right? If you're grinding and hustling and working your, you know, working so hard, but you don't see the fruits of your labor, then that takes its toll psychologically and it, it undermines your energy, your confidence, your, you know, uh, ability to keep getting up and, and grinding the next day. Whereas now you are see getting traction, you're building something, you're seeing, and I'm sure it wasn't linear, but overall you can see that you're getting the rewards for the effort you're putting in. So it kind of, um, although you might be working the same number of hours, it doesn't feel as hard. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. And I would also say that, you know, when I started my firm in 2008, it was May of 2008. And so then we all know what happened in basically August, September, October of 2008. Then we had that, we, then we had an election. Uh, then basically from 09 until I think to the, the early 2012, we were in this recession. And so I just kept my notes with the grindstone. I did some deals split deals with some other recruiters, not even in the industry that I ended up being in. Just basically I turned into a generalist and just made a boatload of phone calls and I tried to be consistent. Um, and, but, but back to that point, yes, it was hard. Yes. It was, what are we doing? I mean, one time my wife called me up and said, we don't, we don't have any money in our account and we need to pay my daughter's lunch money for her preschool. Um, you know, we really didn't go on vacations. We, uh, my, I, you know, my, my brother got married and I was the best man and he wanted me to go down to Miami for his bachelor party. I didn't go, you know, there's all these ski trips. I didn't go on that. I wanted to go on. So there, there, there was a lot of sacrifice with our, you know, with myself and my wife. The other point I want to make Mark about my wife is that she grew up in an entrepreneurial home. Her dad was a business owner and she understood kind of what that might mean. And so had she had her dad been a dentist or a brain surgeon or a corporate person or a teacher, somebody that had a consistent profession income wise, um, it might've been a different story. Cause so, so the, so my, my point is if somebody's thinking about doing a, going out and becoming a, an executive recruiter on their own or starting a search firm and you're married, you better make sure that you're aligned because it can take a toll. I can relate to so much of what you're saying. And, um, absolutely. Uh, I, wow. Yeah. That totally resonates for me. So when you describe working incredibly hard, you had your desk, you had your legal pads, what, what does that mean to you working extremely hard? And also you said you needed to try and be consistent. What is consistency in your, in your world? Well, it goes back to the, to the, I think the, the X's and O's. I mean, I know this sounds probably more like a, like platitudes or a cliche, but like I, I would try to come in and work a desk, work my desk from eight to five Monday through Friday. And so I'm, probably not the most detailed person that, I mean, I'm a, I'm a true salesperson where I probably have ADD and I'm kind of all over the board, but I would say that that's what makes a recruiter really, really good because you can juggle 10 or 12 plates in the air all at the same time. Um, it really, it really went back, Mark. And this is what I learned when I, when I was, you know, coming out of MRI slash sales consultants is that it's an activity based business. It's, you know, 70, 80 phone calls a day. Um, some people might say it's throwing spaghetti against the wall. You can really get into uh, data analytics about planning your day out, which is all great and it works. But I would track phone calls, phone time, and then send outs. And that's really my only my only metrics I, I track currently. So you still track those three. Now, by the way, yeah. send outs to you, is that a client? Is that a candidate going to meet a client or is that? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's fine. And, and it and also it could be just, it could be a team's call. It could be a phone. It could be a phone interview, right. yep. whatever. Got you. Okay. So phone calls, phone time and send outs. Are those still the three things that you track? Yeah, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, even when I sold equipment, it was still about um, how many 
cold calls can you make in a day? Um, you know, if you're driving down the road and you, you see like an industrial park, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, that was, you know, almost 25 years ago, totally different times. Now you could walk into a facility and just pretend like, you didn't know where you were and try to get, you know, in front of some customer. Nowadays you get, you'd get kicked out. <laughs> I used to do, in fact, I don't think many people do this anymore in recruiting. I worked, so it wasn't a search firm. It was a contingency recruitment agency, right? And we would, if I had a client meeting in an industrial park somewhere, I would absolutely be cold calling on all the other places in that, uh, in, you know, in that complex and just trying to find out who, cause of course, no LinkedIn, it's harder to get data. Like who the, who's the managing director, who's the general manager, who's the CEO and are they available for a quick, you know, conversation. And like, I would just cold call or people you couldn't get on the phone, you know, you just turn up, like you call them five times and they're not returning your call. Then you may as well just go and you know, turn up and say, you know, tell him it's Mark Whitby. Um, I've been trying to reach him. He'll he'll know the name and uh, et cetera. So I don't think people do that anymore, but awesome. So uh, so coming back to <clears throat> consistent hard work, um, what are the, so you've told us the three numbers that you track. What are the targets that you set yourself for each of those three numbers? Um, I mean, I don't, I don't track it like, you know, I, I think there, there's probably other firms that, I mean, I can, I can track it. I'm on ring central and so forth. Um, but really for me, like in my own desk and my, in the own deals that I'm in, um, I can, it's almost like an inner clock. I can tell <laughs> when I'm not being as active as what I need to be. And for me, it, it the, that, that metric is probably phone time. I mean, I think phone time is more important than phone calls. Phone calls is a quantity metric, right? But, you know, if you're having very short conversations, you're probably not getting a business out of them, right? No. So the more substantive the conversation is, the, the, the better. And therefore, that means you need more time on the phone rather than just leaving voicemails or talking to, you know, or, or yeah, I, I hear yeah. you. My, my, my goal is to, is to funnel somehow, and, it, and even for the, the people that work for me, everything has to get funneled to a phone conversation. And so over the last three or four years, I've really tried to work on um, my database, uh, growing it, making sure it's accurate, um, which then in turn leads to lead generation, either on the candidate side or on the client side. And then that leads to someone, maybe it's me, maybe it's a, a someone else, to persuade. And if, if we can get out to a point where we can persuade somebody, give me a resume. Why not go out on an interview? Why, why, why wouldn't you go out on, on this interview? Um, those types of, of conversations. Okay. Interesting. I'm good. I've written the word persuade down because I want to circle back to that. But um, so you've focused really hard on building your database and um what are some other differences? Because obviously it's a whole different world, 2024, than it was in 2008 when you first started. What are some of the key things that you're doing differently now, or have have adapted to, you know, stay, you know, stay with the times and leverage technology that's available and so on? Oh, this Mark, this topic is the most important topic for any um, search firm. Um, it's it's exciting, but yes, but yet it's frightening. I mean, up until probably 2016, I really didn't even have a database. I had I, I had this weird platform called High Rise, and it was it, I, it probably worked really well for like a realtor or you know some you know some other sales role. But I somehow made it into my own. Um, it was almost like my own PC recruiter. or or bullhorn or something and it was inefficient so i i would use that legal pads and and outlook and so um uh but the the whole how to capture data is it good data um you know how do you update it it's expensive um it, as small search firms if we can't figure out how to streamline this and make it more efficient 
we're all going to be in real trouble because these larger firms, the huge retained firms, even these uh, um, you know multinational search firms, they have the money and resources to figure out how to do it and do it really, really quick. So that's really what I, I, a light bulb went off and I said, you know what, if I don't get, if I don't at least try to get on top of this, um, I'm going to miss out on, uh, on a lot of uh, potential business. And that goes back to a term that, you know, you know, in the, in my network that I'm a part of Sanford Rose, we talk about, we talk about market mastery and, and, um, uh, I've really tried to implement that into my into my practice. Fantastic! I I had a really good conversation with Jeff K just uh, a few days ago, actually. Um, so I'm very familiar with Sanford Rose. Oh yeah, and uh, we have a couple of clients who are um, Sanford Rose associates as well. Um, yeah. Shout out to Fernando Espinoza. Do you know Fernando? Yeah, he's a. We haven't had too many conversations, but you know, he he, he and I have a similar size firm. Yep. And he 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 produces at, at about the same level that I'm at. So he's he's a very very talented person. No he question. is. He's a such a huge personality, isn't he? Sort <laughs> of. Uh, yeah, we 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 love him. He livens up any any meeting. Um, yeah. So so come back to the technology. Obviously, investing in a database, proper database software, and then you know uh, building that data set obviously is is critical. Um, what are some of the other key pieces that you've you've put in place that allow you to produce at the level you are now? Well, I mean, I, my my data stack is really simple. I mean, I and I'll just tell you, I use I use LinkedIn Recruiter, I use Zoom Info, I use PC Recruiter, um, and I use Outlook. There's some there's some other tools like uh, like earlier earlier this year I I started to use a it's a UK based company called Hinterview. And I will do I will do specific videos and send those out through my, you know, email network, if you will. That seems to help. Um, you know, it's it's no different than probably any other firm. I'm I'm a little bit more active on LinkedIn. Uh, I've utilized offshore uh, researchers to help build my database. Now I have somebody, um, you know, and you know that works directly for me for that. Um, but it's a constant grind and a constant battle to make sure that you're capturing everything that you can in. It's really, and it's, it's tempting to maybe just utilize LinkedIn and, and, you know, not capture, you know, all of that data, but. That would be a mistake. You know. Um, yeah, I've, I have this conversation, by the way, uh, regular listeners would, will will recognize this speech but I'll I'll be brief on my soapbox. LinkedIn is a fantastic tool, but you have to remember this is a multi-billion dollar corporation owned by Microsoft. They do not care about you or need your business, right? They 100%. could switch you off like for no real reason at the, you know, uh because their algorithm picks up something that may or may not be happening on your account that looks suspicious and they just shut it down. And, you know, your if your business relies, you know, primarily on LinkedIn and that's where all your, you know, you don't have your own data set and other ways of reaching out to candidates, then you're, you're toast. Right. So. I agree. And, and you, you know, when you, when you start out and like, let's say you wanted to open up a new, um, niche, you know, a, a different industry. Uh, it can be very powerful to have that because if you know, if you don't have, a, you know, very many contacts. Um, but we all know about the LinkedIn recruiter crutch, and you're absolutely right. Microsoft um, owns LinkedIn, and that's basically big tech. You're at the mercy of big tech, basically. A hundred percent. So, okay. So you also so interviews video is a video platform for sending videos. Do you use it for recruiting or business development or both? Both. And so I'll send out mainly, you know, MPC candidates where I'll package up like a, it's usually under 50 seconds and I'll send MPC presentations out to specific hiring authorities. So it might only be 20 or 25 people, you know, 20 or 25, you know, contact points at a time. And then we follow back up my, um, 
SDR will follow back up with a phone call and an email. First of all, um, your videos, so you're presenting an NPC in a short video presentation in the same way you might have in the olden days, you might have, it would be a cold call, the decision maker answers the phone and you introduce the candidate, Are you? but you're basically doing that via video now. Correct. Okay. It's, it's actually both. It would be in the ideal format, it would be video, phone call, email, then probably another phone call. Okay. Fantastic. And um, are those videos personalized? Like, do you say the the hiring manager's first name and or anything else in those videos? Or is it you record one video and then send it out to everybody? Unfortunately, it's one video and I send it out to everybody. Um, but I, I mean, this may, this may be a bad way to do it, but it's the only way I can do it. I just do it on my iPhone, kind of like a selfie. And um, I don't even really... I don't even really rehearse it because I, I want it to sound genuine. Awesome. I, you should test. You should test, Matt, and see whether doing a personal version of the video um, gets you a higher response rate. And if it doesn't, then obviously keep doing the single video because it's obviously more time efficient. But right. if it, that's the issue. If it significantly increases the number of people come back to you, then you'd argue, well, it's worth taking the extra time. If it's a one minute video, that means, um, to do 25 of them, you could, you could bang that, th those out in an hour. Right. Right. Well, that's, so, that's a good idea. I've, I haven't really yeah. thought of that, but that I probably should do that. Um, well, I, again, I don't know the, the, the only way to know is to test, but these are right. the kind of experiments, like in our coaching program, people are running these kind of experiments all the time to sort of see, well, how can I get a better response to this campaign, whether it's recruiting or business development or what have you. And we, we, we test different things. And, and so a lot of our clients are doing personalized video outreach, whether it's a few people use interview, other people are using loom and there's, there's about a dozen different platforms that allow you to send videos and track who opens them and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, the, it, and it, and that's why you need to test because one person, like I can think of Enrique, who's been on the, on the podcast before he gets about a, now he's using it primarily for recruiting and he's getting something like a 65% response rate on those videos. Which, and he's that's making a, those personal, right? Personal. Right. Exactly. So he'd yeah. say, hi, Matt, I'm looking at your LinkedIn profile. Your background looks perfect for an opportunity et cetera, et cetera. And it'll sell the job. And like, if you want to learn more then you know, just reply back and we'll set up a time to talk, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and then we have another client who's doing it on the BD side and he's getting about a 20% response rate, 20, might be like 23% response, which again, for a cold outreach, that's a high response rate, oh, right? So um, high. And it's way higher than, than phone. Exactly. However, we have others who have done the personalized videos and they're getting a very low response rate. So I think there's so many variables that the only way to know is to really try and, and, and experiment. Yeah. I think it goes back to Mark to, you know, and this is a, you know, a, a, I think a common theme, whether you want to admit it or not, if you're a, an executive recruiter and that's how do we all stay relevant? I mean, there's so much white noise. Everyone's on LinkedIn. Everyone's posting all these things. Um, you know, you can go to trade shows. You can, I just got back from a trade show. You can, you can download lists. Um, the only thing I can think of, and again, this goes back to the grind. This goes back to activity. The only thing I can think of that might separate someone from someone else is, and it's, it's hard to admit this. It, it is the hard work piece of this business which ultimately is activity to get to get someone on a telephone to close them somehow, some way, even if they tell you no. Um, but it's harder and harder now to get whoever it is, candidates. It's easier with candidates, but for sure clients on the telephone or on a Zoom or a Teams or a Ring Central meeting to persuade them. And, and I think that's what all of this is about. So it's all this data, all this technology that we have. It's a, it's wonderful, but it's a, it's a, it's a blessing and a curse all at the same time. 
Yeah, it's funny how in some ways this industry feels easier than in the past, and in some ways it feels harder. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I, I, I grapple with that idea every day. <laughs> um, but listen, I, I don't know if I agree that it's uh, about the differentiating and distinguishing. You're right, there's a lot of noise, and to cut through it, hard work is definitely one way if you can outwork your competitors. But from a marketing point of view, I do think you can package what you do, like package your process, turn it into a product, give it a, a brand name, and basically all the pieces you've described. So like you have a, it's a team effort. It's not just you, you've got, you know, you plus your SDR plus your researcher. So like there's three people on this search effectively, right? Plus you use a multi, uh, it's not just like you, try to reach someone once, right? You have a multi-touch, multi-channel process where you're leveraging video and the latest technologies combined with good old-fashioned persistence in order to ensure that every candidate on your target list who could be a good fit for your client is aware of the opportunity and, you know, the, and you're getting the maximum engagement. You're getting people to listen because that's the hard part these days. You know, everyone has the data, right? Everyone has the data. But if you, and, and then the, the other piece is you're an expert in your industry. You've worked in that industry and you've done it for, you know, uh, recruiting it in it for 20 years. So you know the things to say that are going to capture the interest and attention of your ideal candidate and get them to that phone call. So you could package that up, I think, and even trademark it, Matt, in a way that, when you're selling to clients, they can see, they're like, wow, he has a really, like he's honed this process over 20 years and he now has this like machine that we're going to tap into. He already has the network, he has the knowledge and he's got the technology and he obviously has this system that is going to, you know, generate the best results for us. I think, I think there's something you could do there. What do you think? I do. I, I'm, I feel like I'm getting uh, some, Nice free, free, <laughs> free uh, uh, coaching right now. So I'm, I, I'm very appreciative of that. <laughs> of course, of course. Now I want to talk about your team because your, uh, you mentioned an SDR and you mentioned that you have an in-house person who helps build the database. Could you describe how the the team structure? Yeah. So I have, um, uh, so I have myself, and then I have uh, Michael, who is a remote recruiter. Um, and then I have David who is, he's now remote, but David is a, is a recruiter as well. Ellen is kind of a, an RDR, which is a recruiter development rep slash researcher. And then I have an offshore, um, sales development rep in Brazil, and I'm getting ready to hire actually this coming Monday, another recruiter in Manila in the Philippines. So that, now that that's a new development for me. So that's the, this is really more of an experiment for me to to see how this is going to work. Other offices in my network have tried it, and I know it's kind of a it's a big trend. So it's so interesting because you and I are kind of on the same um, journey here, Matt. Because we're we've followed a similar model. In fact, we've just hired. Um, an SDR, but this guy, he's in the Philippines. His name's Mike. Um, it's so, it's funny because he sounds American, Mike does. Um, and I don't know why. I think there's a long history between the US and the Philippines. Um, but uh, yeah, so so we've got, we're, we're excited to bring Mike on board. Why did you choose Brazil in particular? How did that come about? Well, I didn't really choose that. I mean, that was the the search firm, or excuse me, the, the offshore consulting firm called Hikinex. I don't know if you've heard of them. And they have, they have candidates in Brazil, I think in Colombia, and then in, in the Philippines. But I think they're based out of the Philippines. And even, even this Sophia who works for me, I mean, her English is, there's a little bit of an accent, but their English is unbelievable. Um, and you talk about activity and grinding. They, if you give them a list of things to do, Let's say, okay, you need to make 80 calls, they will go make 80 calls. And so I think the, the struggle I've found is you go out, you know, and try to find somebody in West Michigan, you know, as a sales development rep, and they're 20, you know, they're 24 years old, they just graduated, 
it's a higher base salary. There's a 401k. There's, I don't really want to make 80 calls. I'll make 50 calls. Oh, by the way, I have to leave this Thursday for a wedding. Okay. All that stuff is okay. Um, but if you, if you need production, um, again, this is new for me. It's, it's really more of an experiment. I might eat my words, but, uh, uh, I think it makes a heck of a lot of sense. It absolutely makes sense. We have, I'd say we have about a 90% success rate of getting our clients to successfully hire and integrate offshore team members. We use the general term virtual assistant, but that could be a sourcer, it could be a recruiter, it could be a you know, sales development rep, or, or it could be an administrator or an operations person, social media, you know, marketing or whatever. Um, it, it absolutely, that doesn't mean the first person or every person you hire is going to work out. Like we are in recruitment. We should know that not every hire is successful, of course, but uh, for all the reasons you just said, it is worth persisting and working at it to make it work because uh, the work ethic, the grind, as you said, and, you know, combined with uh, the, the, the cost savings of hiring someone offshore, it's a, I think it's a no-brainer. I don't know why every uh, search firm doesn't doesn't do it. So. And, and it's so. And again, th- th- this goes back. And I, I see other firms that somehow can. Maybe I don't have the rights. I mean, I think when you're a, I have you know when you're a, in a rainmaking model, which is what I'm in. Um, I have to produce. I have to be out, um, getting. I mean, I handle all of the all of every single one of the deals. I have no one that handles the you know any of the clients. So that takes time. And so do I have time to go and train this person or that person? Um, that's been really hard for me. And I haven't been very successful in finding someone else to come in, either a former recruiter or an industry person that, let's say, has experience in material handling and wants to come in and you know mainly work on commission and you know delve into the world of, of the crazy world of executive search. Yeah. <laughs> So. Do you know what? I think you could, and and this is the thing. Um, by the way, you've done a beautiful job of explaining the. I actually did a presentation. We we do twice a year. We get all our clients together in person. Once in the UK, so our next one's in London in the end of April, and then once in the US. So we're meeting in St. Petersburg, Florida, in October. And last October in St. Pete, I did a presentation on the uh, structure and organization chart of a seven-figure search firm and what i described is almost exactly what you just what you just described so you it's the rainmaker model you've got the you know founder managing partner uh running the show but then they're supported by the client side and the candidate side and then there's the support team which could include you know the data slash research it could include like marketing support. Um, right. And then, so on the on the candidate side, you've got the recruiter or recruiters, and they may be like, they may have a dedicated sourcer who's just focused on, on data, or the sourcer could be shared between business development and recruiting, right? Depending on how right. you want to do things. Then you've got the... Um, the AE or salesperson who's the client facing, uh, as well as managing the, the 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 project and overseeing, making sure the deal closes, uh, and then they're supported by that data person who's feeding them leads and so on. And it sounds like basically you're you're doing the AE job as well, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I yeah, and I I run what's called the the a column system on, you know, if it's a well, if it, it's how I organize all the commissions and the revenue. So if 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 if, if it's a twenty thousand dollar fee, and it's my client, and I run the the client side, the recruiter does the initial reach out to the to the you know potential candidate. They have the the initial intake call. They get the resume. They summarize up. You know they they summarize their conversation. Get that over to me. Their their portion of the revenue is in my in my firm would be you know fifty 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 percent the work they did and fifty fifty percent of the work that I do. Um, so 
But back to what you're talking about with this rainmaking model, the one thing that's really interesting, Mark, is someone now who's in their early 50s. I'm 51 years old. Yeah, me is, too. I'm turning it, 51 in a couple of months. Oh, awesome. Um, is, you know, that setup usually doesn't bode well. I guess this could be an entirely different podcast conversation. When you want to sell it, when you want to get out. And so, um, you know, I've really struggled with that idea where, and maybe I'm okay with the fact that maybe I only want to do this until I'm 60. I've made enough money where I can put it away and let, you know, compound interest be my friend, if you will. And maybe on, you know, March 15th, you know, 2034, I just turn the light off and walk out the door. You know, this is okay. This could be a whole separate podcast conversation, <laughs> but let's, let's talk about it because you're not the only one who's having these questions. Like what happens when, because the reality is no one is going to come along and give you a large pot of money for a small practice in, you know, direct hire practice where you are the primary fee earner and then you'd be leaving once you sell the business. That's just, it's not worth much to somebody who would be taking that business over. But yeah. I, I have three thoughts about this. Thought number one is if you're making great money and you're enjoying what you're doing, why, why retire? Why not just keep it going, but maybe like level up the, the involvement of your team and scale back your own direct, you know, workload. Um, and then you're still drawing an income, but, uh, yeah. and, and doing, doing, Keep it, you know, because I think when people retire, they they go downhill. And from what I've seen, like well, I, yeah, I, I mean, I I'm not I'm not saying that I will retire. Maybe I would go, you know, maybe maybe another maybe a larger firm would buy me, and I would just come in as a individual contributor. You know, it's no different than a financial planner that they might be on their own, and then all of a sudden, you know, Merrill Lynch or Baird or J.P. Morgan says, "Hey, why don't you come? You know, with all your knowledge and all your this this niche that you're in." Why don't you come in and join us? Well, now all of a sudden they they pay for all the data data, all the all, all the overhead. I'm 60 years old, so it's a, the, all the all those types of thoughts go through your head. I think it's different because if you're because you have as a financial advisor, you have uh, your assets under management, right? Correct. It Which is different. You're right. They're buying, and that's going to continue generating. You know. Um, right returns for the company that's acquiring your your business right. whereas in recruiting in permanent recruitment like there's no there's no guarantee that you're going to make anything next month especially if right. you know right. if, if uh, Matt Balama is you know sitting on the beach so um so I think that's different but I do think you could potentially find I'm not saying this is easy by the way but you were recruiters for goodness sake right if you decided I'm going to find a really awesome AE, either based maybe in Michigan or somewhere else in the US, and they're going to be my apprentice, and uh, I'm going to nurture them to, to get more involved in the sales side of things, business development, as well as client development, and you know, managing the, 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 the whole deal uh, architecture, then... Um, that gives you more freedom as the owner, right? Oh, of course. And I, that's still a possibility for me. My, my point is, is that when you're, you know, I probably need, need to do a better job of trying to figure out what that might look like. Um, and, you know, that's why you're a part of a large, you know, franchise group like SRA. They, they do a really good job in trying to consult people like me with those types of uh, conversations. Um uh, so, but those are great points, Mark. There's no question about it. Cause we've spoken before in preparation for this, um, this conversation, you said something interesting, which is I've made people into multimillionaires by my placements and changed lives and family trees. Could you say a little about that? Yeah. I mean, I, I have, um, this is one of those questions where I probably won't, I'll probably think of a really good example, like in about 10 hours. <laughs> um, but you know, if you can, you can look at, you You can answer that question in a lot of different ways. One of them is, you know, there's, there's countless salespeople that I've placed that I would get no credit for 
except to get a, a search firm you know, placement fee. Let's say it's a $30,000 fee. Well, there's probably over, I don't know, multiples of people that have come in and have brought in hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue into a company. And executive recruiters get no credit for that. Um, yeah, we have, there's, there's bad things that can happen and people leave after 90 days and we, we all know about that, but we not only change company family trees, if you can use that term, but for sure, personal family trees. And, um, you know, um, you know, I have, uh, you know, let, you know, multiple examples of, of people that, you know, maybe they were living in Atlanta. Like I'll give you an example. There's this one person, obviously I'm not going to name his name, but he, you know, lived in Atlanta. There was a, there was a, an opportunity for him to become president of, um, a, you know, a midsize equipment dealership. Um, he decided to take the plunge and, and go over there. And, uh, you know, I'm sure now he's a, he's a millionaire. And if he hadn't have done that, if I hadn't have made that phone call, if you will, um, uh, you know, he, now obviously he was willing to take the risk. Um, he wouldn't have been in that situation now. A hundred percent. Look, there's no question that we, what we do has real world consequences. We do change people's trajectories, both the, on the client side, as well as on the candidate side. And like your you made that happen, right? And without your input, now some of those people would have still moved on and found better situations, and and some of those companies may have found their A player some way or another. But some of them wouldn't, right? Some of them would not have connected or had the same positive outcome without your personal intervention. So I think that's, um, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, and I have I have a lot of people that that come up to me at trade shows or. I run into them and they say, look, he's they're like, you know, I, this was the best thing that I've ever done. And I, I just want to thank you. And, uh, that's the other side of this business that we, we might not pay attention to because, you know, let's be honest. A lot of us are just, we're just, we're money driven people. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, you can make a lot of money in the executive search business, but guess what else happens? We help a lot of companies out and we help people out, which is obviously a lot more important. Yeah, fantastic. Matt, you said something to me before, which I thought was interesting, is that like um, fear is like you're sort of motivated by fear uh, to some extent. Could you elaborate on on that and also how you've harnessed that as a motivator rather than to it, like hold you back from going for, you know, going for it and, and, you know, achieving your goals. I am kind of the, the traditional firstborn, uh, kind of a, oh, me too. um, I guess type a, um, someone who I, I have this motivation where I, I want to, in some ways, maybe prove people wrong and say, Hey, I, I can, I can do this. Um, um, you know, but the fear part is maybe it's a, it's a cross between, um, trying to be humble with, um, more of a, of a imposter syndrome where I don't, I don't deserve this at all, uh, with just pure fear. What if I don't, what if I go blank for two months in a row and, I have, now I have two kids or I'm, I'm going to have two kids in college and my wife, we, my wife and I want to do this and I've already set a, our lifestyle up to this level. But if these four things don't happen, I mean, every year, I'm sure every other recruiter does this too. I look back and say, I had this great year, but if, if this guy didn't take the job, if this guy went with a different way, you know, if this company ended up hiring their internal candidate, now I'm not, now I'm out of, you know, $125,000 of fees. So in the contingent in the, in the direct higher placement world, there's all these things that no one realizes until you're into it that have to come into play. Which you have Almost no like control over a lot of them have, as well, right? You have no control over, but you're, you're banking on the fact that, you know, we're going to buy this condo. We're going to, 
I'm going to lease this SUV. No one out the, the you know the 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 bank doesn't care what your story is, right? Nope. They so do not. Did did any of these bad things that I was always worried about happen to me? No. Um but uh so that's a motivator. Now some psychologists will probably say, well, that's that's not the way to do it, or some business coach. But we all we're all motivated by something. Yeah. It's really interesting how many of us in the recruiting business or who are small business owners are motivated by fear. And um, my friend Rich Rosen actually said the exact same thing. He was he's been on the podcast a few times and he and I speak quite often. Um He's he's built a million dollars a year plus for like 20 years, right? And he's got investments. He's he's set up, right? But he told me that he feels at any moment it could all be taken away, right? And 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 that means he can't stop working. He's still got that that drive or that that hunger to, you know, to to just keep grinding it to in 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 the in the way that you put it. Um because and it's irrational, right? But uh it's funny how we have these uh, recruiters can be quite a neurotic bunch. Um, I think you have to be a little bit unhinged to to want to do this for a living. But oh, I think I think we're all um, we're a cross between like like being pirates and and probably having this is gonna this might sound insensitive, but maybe being uh, <laughs> a little bit. You might want you want to call them crazy, but maybe a little bit of like you said, being unhinged or um, just uh, I don't want to say sick, but just like very much different than the other parts of society. Let's say it like that. <laughs> yeah, it's a different it's a different mindset to uh, you know, and as you said right at the beginning, like it takes grind but also guts you do have to have guts to uh you know to chart your own course here and um sail the seven seas so yeah uh, awesome the the one thing the one thing i was going to say is the one interesting question i always ask myself is uh if i went down the street to a gas station and bought a super lotto ticket and i won let's just pretend i won 200 million dollars and after taxes i netted 100 million dollars now I have a hundred million dollars. Would I be less effective as a search firm owner, or more effective? And and I w- I would argue that that um, if you if you had that confidence behind you, I probably would bill more money. So that that might be counterintuitive to what I just said about being driven by fear. Um, but if you if you can have that mindset of I have you know a hundred million dollars in my back pocket. Um, you might have a lot more confidence and end up getting a lot more business because you really, you really don't need the business. So what if you could pretend that you gave off this aura that I really don't need this placement? You would make more placements. It's so interesting. You've just given me a, a huge flashback, Matt. I was asked to speak uh, to a recruiting firm probably 20 years ago, and uh, I wanted to come up with something different that maybe they hadn't heard before. And so, and I don't, I honestly don't know where the story came from, whether I had heard it somewhere and kind of put my own spin on it. Uh, and if I'm stealing someone's story, then I, I apologize. If you've heard this before, then let me know what the source is. But in any case, um, there was a woman who was a recruiter and she was really struggling having, you know, the business wasn't working out. She was, you know, not making enough placements to cover her overheads. She was really at the end of her rope and she was um, she was sitting in a park on a bench just trying to figure out what am I going, you know, what am I going to do? This is like, I, I need to make something happen quickly. And then uh, a gentleman came down and sat down beside her, could see she was in distress and they got talking and he wrote her a check for a million dollars and said... You probably won't need this, but put it in your wallet and it's there, you know, just t- as a safety net. And she was overjoyed and she like couldn't believe it. And so she went back to her office and the pressure, then she felt this like the 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 pressure disappeared 
And she suddenly was more focused. She was more productive. She was more confident. And she absolutely turned her business around and she smashed it. And she ended up becoming a millionaire in her own right. And she didn't need that. She didn't need to fall back on that check. And so when she, um, when she made her first million, she went back to the park to try and bump into because she didn't get the gentleman's name who had written her that check. And to her surprise, she discovered that the gentleman who wrote her the check was actually a homeless person who didn't have a million dollars that, but was in, was deluded and thought that they were a wealthy person. And the check that she was carrying around was, uh, was a rubber check, but, um, you know, she didn't, she didn't know that that was the case. I, I mean, it's the mind games that, again, you know, it's not just executive recruiters. It could be any, it could be a franchise owner of a Jersey Mike's or a, a, a guy that owns a, a concrete business. The, but the, the mind games of an entrepreneur, you, you really have to uh, keep everything in check. Um, think of the, of, of the, of the long, the, the, the long game. Um, you know, there's a reason why you got to the point that you're at now. That wasn't by mistake. Um, and you're going to have ups and downs. You're going to have some, some years aren't going to be like you want to want them to be. It doesn't make you a bad salesperson, a bad business owner. Um, especially in the world that we're in where so many of these deals are really out of our control. Matt, well said. That was a good pep talk if anyone needed to hear that. Um, fantastic. Listen, this was a lot of fun. Thanks for being on the show. I really enjoyed it. Uh, my first podcast, hopefully not my last, and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. It was awesome. All right. Thanks, Matt.